Hello everyone. Welcome to our third lecture. So hopefully um, you've been learning a lot and I know this is a lot of material to cover uh, in two hours of uh, coursework that we had so far, but uh, stick around and you learn a lot. Today's class especially is uh, one of the key uh, things that I would explain that would stick with you for a long time to come. So I have also asked the moderators to uh, enable chat for today. So if you see questions that are repeating and you can answer, please help each other out. I think this is all about building a learning community. And um, while I'm presenting, uh, I usually don't get a chance to look at the questions and answer them. And if I answered all the questions, then we wouldn't have time to go through the coursework. So if you uh, see something that you can answer, just go ahead and uh, uh, say something in the chat and uh, also keep asking questions in the Q&A as well. And um, I will try to answer them at the beginning of each class, uh, any questions that come in. So having said that, uh, let's begin. So it's a lot of material to cover. We are a little behind, but we'll catch up. So because I want to make sure in this foundational beginning classes, you get the material that I'm talking about. So it will make um, the later classes much, much easier as we go a little bit higher level later. So, and if you are saying good morning, hello, uh, just tell me where you are from, uh, what you hope to learn and uh, anything that you want to talk about. So um, let's with that. And, and then also uh, keep paying attention to um, the presentation and the coding exercises that we do online um, instead of focusing on the chat because then otherwise you would miss out on those things. Also the videos for um, the first two classes are out there. And if you get a chance to uh, take a look, if you're missing something in your learning, you can uh, go and watch them. Um, and um, at the same time, we also figured out all the issues uh, with um, uh, sharing of the uh, presentations and the collab notebooks. So if you go to the shared folder now, you should be able to see everything that is there. So if you have any problems in the future, please let us know and we'll try to fix them as soon as possible. All right, so um, with that, let's begin. So today is uh, class three, and um, we are going to do a quick recap, cover some questions, and uh, we'll do some classification. Uh, we did regression last time, um, and then we'll cover some um, theory uh, behind uh, maximum likelihood estimation, which seems like a complicated uh, set of words, but we'll go over that, and if we have time, uh, we will cover autoencoders as well. So just um, looking at what we did last time, we built a simple, uh, uh, fully connected neural network, and we used that for regression for predicting home prices. And we had um, an input layer of size eight and the two hidden layers of size 32, all fully connected, and an output layer that was the median home price value for a block. That was what we were trying to predict. So that all uh, went fine. I think we had a lot of questions um, about why, um, why these things, and these are really good questions. So, so I put them, uh, I think I took a selection of the questions and most of them were uh, either a variation of these questions. So if you don't see your specific questions, I apologize, but it's, it's a summary of basically all the questions that I got. And um, so most of the questions revolved around why did we choose those specific number of layers or nodes or batch sizes or epochs. So that's, that's the art. So you will find yourself doing this a lot where you start off with some network and then try to adjust these things. So these things are called hyperparameters and um, you are supposed to adjust them to get to a loss that is as low as possible at the same time, you don't want to overfit. So you're going to balance that with the proper sizes of the batches of the layers and the nodes and epochs. So, so that uh, takes time. And that's uh, what um, the whole field is about is trying to get to the right answer by adjusting these hyperparameters. And um, if um, you do it manually, uh, and then you look at the losses and then find out which combination gives you the lowest loss um, over time. Uh, and then you can automate some of that. If you had a lot of computing resources, you could um, write a loop and you could go over 
multiple examples of different number of layers, different number of nodes, and you could do that and let it run for days. And then, then from the answers that you get, you pick the one with the lowest uh, uh, combination. So you could, you could do that uh, with a uh, uh, lot of resources if you have them. Or some people have done this, you could write another neural network to kind of figure out what is the optimum size of these layers. So that's an advanced topic and we can go into that later. But there are ways to do this, but mostly it's an art form where you try it and uh, see how things go. So no, no prescribed method to get a fixed number of uh, layers or nodes that will give you the right answer. So then the next question is about strings and categorical values. So if you have strings in your data, so one thing um, I should mention that we cannot use strings. Everything has to be numbers. So if you have any strings that need to be encoded in some kind of numerical format, if you have categorical values, something like um, A, B, and C, you need to encode that into numbers as well um, with some zero, one, or two numbers. So uh, all of these things need to be converted into some form of numerical values that we can use. So we'll um, cover some of that when we do uh, classification, um, but that's the idea that you cannot use strings, you have to use numbers. Normalization versus standardization, again, it's a, it's a way to get your numbers in a range that is easier for the gradient descent to work. It is not absolutely necessary, but you, um, it helps, it uh, gets to the lower losses faster. Uh, the gradients converge a little bit faster if you normalize or standardize. So which one to use, uh, it's not, um, again, it's not prescribed. You can try both and see which one works better for your uh, data. And then somebody asks, uh, if this is a linear regression, why are we using a neural net? So, so this is not a linear regression. So we left linear regression with our line equation. This is a regression uh, with um, um, any kind of functional combination. So we are using um, an activation function that introduces nonlinearity. So we are not using linear regression uh, at this point. So somebody else had a question about classifying images. Like, will we have only one feature or input when we classify images? So when we deal with images, uh, images are uh, complex things. Uh, if you look at uh, a particular image, each pixel is a RGB combination, it's red, blue, and green combination. So in cases of images, we would use each pixel as a feature. So you can see that number of features in an image is, uh, is huge. So even for a small image like 100 by 100, you will have 100 times 100 times 3, which is one each for R, G, and B. So the number of features can explode when you are dealing with images. So that's, um, that's the entire point of using advanced networks like a convolutional neural network. So you can manage that uh, explosion in dimension of your features. So we'll uh, cover that in detail when we deal with images. Um, next question, uh, is there anything extra happening at the end of each epoch? So nothing extra happening uh, other than it's also the end of a batch. So remember at the end of each batch, you are updating the weights and then um, uh, doing the back propagation and adjusting them slightly. So uh, that's what also happens at the end of each epoch. And then in this particular case with TensorFlow, it also updates all the history object and takes care of uh, updating all the losses and everything. So, so that's what is happening. So if you looked at the batch size versus epoch, so the larger the batch um, is, uh, the faster things go because you only update the weights at the end of each batch. So the smaller the batch size, which in um, a terminal case would be one row of data per batch, you would be updating after every row of data and that would make things slower and things would work better, but again, things will get very, very slow. Uh, so, so we use batch sizes uh, essentially to speed up things a little bit. Um, then um, this question about how much data is needed, um, it all depends on the kinds of problems you're trying to solve. Sometimes uh, 
data is not enough and uh, you will know because uh, it's hard uh, to predict for the new data. So the idea is that the data should cover your whole um, uh, range of values that are possible for the function that you're trying to predict. So if you, for example, were trying to use the sine function and if you don't have enough data, then you're not covering the sine curve uh, exactly, uh, which means data is missing. Uh, you learn from missing data, um, but then you are not able to predict properly. So um, it all depends on the problem. And sometimes, uh, so in any case, more data is good, more data of the right kind. Uh, so again, that's not a prescription, um, but you get as much data as possible. And then you can always throw away data that you don't need. All right, so these were all the questions and uh, we can uh, go ahead and uh, look at um, uh, the homework problem. So homework problem, some people try to solve it, um, the sine equation, and I hope you tried different combinations of nodes and uh, other things that I mentioned to tune the hyperparameters and um, the extra credit question about using the sine equation uh, to predict uh, we can uh, look at some code here that I wrote. Um, and I didn't change anything much from uh, the previous example we had, except um, changing the data, which was we need the sign data. So what I'm doing here is uh, just generating 20,000 points of, at random. So this random function will give me a value between zero and one. And uh, in this case, I'm just multiplying it by 10 to make it uh, a little bit larger. So I get uh, 20,000 points, uh, that is my input, x data. So I convert it into a pandas data frame so I can do some operations on it. Uh, and then rest of the thing follows the same process as we did last time. So I save 20% uh, for testing. So 80% goes to training and then 20% for testing. And then to generate the ground truth, uh, we don't need to have a spreadsheet or anything. We can just generate this because we know it's a sine function. So what I'm gonna do here is uh, apply the sine function to each value in the uh, x um, axis. So the, uh, the y column basically gets applied uh, sine function. So we get uh, y values, which is the ground truth. And we do the same thing for the testing data. So that's what it should look like. Um, if you look at the 20,000 points now, uh, separated into training and testing, where testing is uh, 4,000 and uh, training is 16,000. And these are the uh, X values and these are the corresponding Y values, which is the sign of that number. So it's hard to look at numbers because we have a sign curve, we can just plot it. Uh, so here I'm just uh, plotting X versus Y, and here it is our input data, perfect sine curve. Um, and then we are gonna try to see if we can predict that. Um, so same network as before, except what I've done is I've added an extra layer here and um, up the size to 64, and that should be it. And uh, that's all I'm doing. Uh, I changed this um, loss to average error just as a way to show you that you can use different kinds of losses. Uh, you could use uh, other loss as well. It should be pretty similar. So let's go ahead and run this, uh, build this model. And that's our summary, three layers now of uh, 64 nodes each. The total number of parameters has grown. It is now 8,500. And uh, it should run a little bit slower, but uh, it should be okay. So this part where I plot the graph, it looks uh, like what we wanted it to. Uh, so it's always a good idea to see everything is of the right size that you wanted, things are connected the way you want it. So let's uh, train this now. So we run this uh, fit method, which is going to go in a loop and train in batches. Uh, as you see, losses start decreasing. And it's pretty rapidly decreasing, it's nice, and then it slows down a bit, and that's fine. So we trained for only 10 epochs, and we got a pretty nice uh, uh, loss going down as we expected to. And then let's look at um, our graphs. So these look pretty good. So the validation loss is uh, nice. It's going along with the training loss. So that's what we want. 
and um, we can print the final loss value that we got, which is low and nice. So now we can predict. So let's see. So instead of um, kind of predicting values and looking at them, we can predict the values and then plot them. So because this is a sine curve, they should just be on top of each other, which they are kind of. So, so there's some deviation here, but it looks like it's a nice curve. There's some overshooting here, there's some under uh, here, but that's pretty nice. So um, uh, we can do the usual plot where we do X versus Y, and that is kind of around the diagonal for most values that looks okay. Um, and then if you look at the distribution of it, it also is, this is zero. So it looks decent. It's a little bit skewed towards the right. And uh, we can try to fix that. Uh, you can, first thing we can notice is that the loss is still going down and we can train for longer. So if we continue to train it, let's uh, train for a little bit longer. Let's do 10, 10 more epochs. So again, if I didn't rebuild the model, it will pick up from where it left. So it's, uh, uh, the loss is 0 0.06 and it keeps decreasing. Um, so it decreases slowly. Uh, as we go along, things decrease slower. And let's plot the second part of the thing. It's still pretty good. It's going down still. And um, our loss now is uh, even lower. So this should look even better. So as we do it, so it's a tighter fit now. And um, uh, it looks like it's moving along pretty fine. So if you train for a little longer until you reach a point where you overtrain, where you are not going to be able to predict, but it's going to be uh, just fine. So hopefully things are self-explanatory. And I can share this later, um, this particular sheet, if you have trouble understanding this, you can try different values. So one thing I want to point out in this sine curve is that um, we, our data is not enough in the high curvature part. So if you look at these points, so you see that the X moves pretty slowly, um, or X moves pretty fast in the X direction, whereas the Y is um, like, it has a steep curve here. So the data is not gonna be distributed well enough. So um, what you want is more points here, more points here. So that would kind of get rid of the kink in this area. So, so that's something that is hard to do for a sine curve because you want to go by the arc length and I don't want to get into the math of all that. But um, the idea is that you want to see that you provide enough data to your problem. So in the old days, when they first started doing spam detection, um, so you can detect spam, uh, spam email or non-spam email. So that's um, easy to detect. Um, but then you don't have enough spam emails, then you won't be able to find out what spam looks like. So, uh, but because of this self-fulfilling prophecy, we got so much uh, spam email that now it's easy to train. Uh, if you look at how Google uh, detects spam, it's so good that you hardly see any spam in your real inbox. So, so the idea is that you want to give data that is not frequent enough. You want to give more of that so that it's available for training. So let's uh, pause here. Um, and um, go back to our lecture series. So last time when we stopped, uh, we had not covered classification yet, so which we're going to do today. Um, so the idea behind classification is um, that you, um, you have a bunch of data and they are pre-classified, which means uh, each row is set to belong to some class and you may have five or six classes or many classes. And you want to find out, given a new data point, like which class does it belong to? And we do that by finding the maximum likelihood. And I'll go over what that is um, in a bit. So let's uh, go back to the slide deck from last time, which the parts that we didn't cover in um, classification. So, all right. So, um, this one, let's jump right ahead because um, I think you'll learn more by actually doing it. So, 
let's look at the spreadsheet or the collab sheet. So hope this is visible. Let me increase the size a bit. Okay, so we're doing the same thing as before, importing some libraries. And this time we are reading some data, again, as uh, CSV files. It's called iris training and dot CSV. And we read the file and we uh, print uh, what's in the file. So if I execute that, and it looks like it has some columns that are labeled. And the first row of um, our data set has some numbers in the beginning, and then it has some names. And, um, and then you have some columns here. So if you um, read about what this data comes from, uh, what it contains is data about flowers, or iris flowers specifically. And they have three subspecies of these flowers uh, named Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Again, don't worry about what all these are. Just um, remember that there are three kinds of uh, iris flowers that are in this data set. And there are 120 data points. So again, not much data. Uh, so you can see that we can still train with small amounts of data <laughs> because the data is varied enough and it's in a, some way, it, it's kind of uh, already self-clustering. So, and then there's another number called four, which um, basically in this case means um, there are four uh, columns that are four features that are available to us. And then the last column here is the uh, ground truth or the given classification, where zero means it's a setosa, one means it's versicolor, and then two means it's virginica. So that's the classification. So this, this header gives you some information that is compressed. So we're gonna replace this with the proper headers to kind of help us guide in the way what actual data is. So just to show you what these flowers are and what they look like. So it's a good idea when solving a problem to look at what this data is and where it comes from and why it is the way it is. So in practice, in an industry, if you were working on these kinds of problems, you would consult uh, an expert in that area. So hopefully you'll have access to somebody who can tell you what this data is and why it is hard to classify or why the way things are. So um, you can see these three species. Uh, they are pretty similar looking uh, visually, but there are subtle differences. And um, so hopefully we can identify those differences and uh, classify them properly using a neural network. So these features that are listed here, um, these are actually sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And the last column is the species, uh, this two, one, or zero. And uh, these, uh, this is what zero, one, and two means. So, so we are gonna use these proper headers now. So all I'm doing here is replacing the header from before by this new header so that it's easy to read. So let's see what it looks like. So now we have proper headers uh, put in place and uh, we can tell what these columns are. Uh, and then looking at the statistics of this data, we can see it varies a lot. Um, there is uh, uh, the means and the max. So we may need to normalize this or standardize it as we need to. So. So that's um, what this problem is about. So we are given some data about flowers and we are going to find out uh, how to classify a new data point into the proper species category. So going back to our presentation. So framing the data, again, use this uh, in the beginning when you are learning this uh, subject, use this uh, set of seven uh, uh, processes to solve your problems. So we frame our problem, what is observed and what answer do you want to predict? So we've given data about three species of iris flowers. So second step uh, you do is uh, data collection, um, which we already have, so we don't have to collect it. So now we can uh, do the usual stuff where we plot and look at the data, split it and normalize it. So let's do that next.
All right, so so let's plot this data. So the spare plot is going to plot because we don't have uh, too much data. We can plot everything at the same time, and we have only four features. So it's going to plot all the four features um, against each other. So actually five if you include the species. So let's look at this. Uh, it's going to take some time, but not too much, hopefully. All right, so here it is. Um, all the data, all the five times five, that is 25 data points. And um, let's uh, take a brief look at what this means. I'm going to move this a little bit so you can see everything. So clearly, you can see there is already some correlation happening. Um, if you look at, so anytime you have a correlation, you have a diagonal uh, in this direction, which means these two things kind of go hand in hand, whatever they are. So in our case, we can see that uh, the pedal length and pedal width, they kind of go hand in hand. So they're almost correlated. The longer the pedal length, the longer the width is. So that's good to know about our data. And um, one thing else you will notice is the rightmost column. So this data, because it is categorical, it's either zero or one or two, it is not gonna be spread out. So you'll always have these lines here because it's a category. So you'll always see that. So rest of the data is kind of distributed. Um, so you, in always you want to go look at the data and see if you see obvious correlations and what is happening, why the data is the way it is. So this looks good, but um, we can do more with just colors. So let's do one thing. We can um, plot the same data, but this time we can assign colors to different species to see what happens. Um, So I'm going to do another pair plot, again, the same thing, except I am going to use color codes for style. So, and then I'm going to use this uh, species as a uh, trigger into the color of the data. So let's do that. All right, so you got the same graph, but in color now. And um, the great thing about this is, um, you can tell a whole lot from just this graph. So you can already see that they are separated by pedal length versus pedal width. So if you see all the green ones, so what has happened is that the green um, is um, species two, blue is species zero, and the orange is species one. So already some clustering is happening. So you can tell that this is easy to figure out what belongs to um, species zero, because we can say that whenever the pedal length is below two, everything else is uh, species zero. And the only problem is then how do we separate these two? So we can draw a line and say, okay, this line is good enough, but we're gonna use a neural network. So it's gonna do a nice little separation. It may draw a nice curve that kind of fits around this thing. So. So this clustering is easy for species zero, but species one and two, they are kind of intermingled. So there may be some overlap in the species. So that's what we are gonna to try to solve using this neural network. All right, so that uh, looks good. So I think this um, graphing it in this way has already kind of solved half of our problem. So we could just write a simple program that says species uh, pedal length less than two, then it all belongs to species zero. Uh, but uh, let's continue on and uh, do more. All right, so let me take a breather and um, let's see if any questions have come up. Um, All right, so so I got a flag that says that the files that are on the drive are not matching the one I'm using. So 
for now, just follow along. I think it should be fine. Um, you, I'll send them out again after the class, but uh, for now, just follow along with uh, what I'm showing. Um, it's probably easier to do that anyway. So I'll send the right files at the end of the class. Okay, so now that we have our graph, we know the data, we are going to do the same thing what we did last time, which we are going to take some out for testing. So we do 80% for training, 20% for testing. Um, that's good. And uh, now we need to separate out the species because that is our ground truth. So I am going to take that out um, and then assign that to y train as the ground truth. And we normalize the training data and that's good. And um, we do the same thing with the testing data set and we normalize the testing data as well. So remember, we are not normalizing the Y because we don't want to change. Um, we want to keep it categorical. We want to keep it to zero, one, or two. We don't want to make it into a floating point number in between zero and one, because that doesn't make sense because we are not uh, predicting um, a numerical value. We're predicting a category in this case. So let's look at what this data looks like after splitting and normalizing. So we had 100 and 20 data points. Um, we separated them out 80% for training, 20% for testing, normalized it, and uh, minimum and maximum should be zero and one for all data points. And that all looks good, and that's what we wanted. So let's build our model. So again, model is exactly the same as last time. So nothing has changed about this. Same, 32 nodes in first layer, 32 nodes in the second layer, dense, which means it's fully connected. And output is what we are changing. So we now have three nodes in the output, one for each category. So imagine what you will get out is not a number, but some kind of probability of which uh, the and the output that has the highest probability is likely the one that you want to assign as the class. So you'll get um, some number that we will treat as probability and try to figure out which class it belongs to based on which has the highest probability. Next, we compile the model and um, using an optimizer, uh, which is uh, what does the gradient descent with a learning rate of 0 0.001. And uh, this is where the big difference comes from, is we are going to use a loss function, which is called sparse categorical cross entropy. This is a big sounding set of words, and I will cover that in detail for now. Uh, take it at face value that this is going to give you some kind of probabilities as the answer. So. Again, don't worry about it. We will cover it in uh, detail uh, just in a few minutes. Um, so imagine that instead of giving you a number, it will give you for each category a probability like 10. So let's see what this model looks like. Uh, again, same thing, no change except for the output. There are three nodes now. And uh, we can also plot the model. Um, which is uh, the same representation graphically, um, which looks good. So now let's do um, something uh, which we didn't do last time, which was uh, we'll just try to predict right now, uh, say without training and see what happens. So um, if you take 10 data points from the training, uh, again, we can take a batch from the training and try to predict it because we are not used the training data for anything yet. And then I'm going to predict from the model without training and you should get some answers. And uh, what I said earlier was what you get out of prediction for uh, uh, this kind of uh, classification is a is not one number, but uh, one for each class. And it gives you something called a likelihood. Uh, a likelihood is like a log um, function. And uh, what you want to do that is convert that into probabilities. And you use a function called softmax. And softmax is, is like a normalization in the log space. 
and it converts uh, these log likelihoods into probabilities. And um, then we can look at these probabilities. So if we have, um, what we get out is uh, for each, each um, input for prediction, you get three numbers. And for each class, you get some log likelihood. And uh, again, if you don't understand fully what a log likelihood, don't worry about it. I will cover it. I feel like I'm talking like uh, Andrew Wang, but he says, don't worry about it. If you don't understand, you'll get to it later. So, um, so what, well, from the log likelihoods, we use something called softmax, which does a kind of a normalization or standardization in the log space, and it converts it into probabilities. So then you get three probabilities per data point, and because we haven't trained and the weights are random, uh, you should get random equal probabilities, which should be around 0.33 uh, because they should all add up to one. Um, so that's what we're getting here. So this is a way to sanity check your uh, network uh, without having to train it first. To, are you getting the kinds of answers you expect? So, um, so which in this case, uh, we are. We are uh, converting from log likelihoods to probabilities, and these probabilities add up to one, which makes sense. And then also they are, because they should be random, because we haven't trained yet, they should be around 0.33, which they are. So, so that's good. So that means our network makes sense, and now we are ready to train. So because we don't have a whole lot of data, we are going to use a smaller batch size, and um, we're gonna do some validation split as well. Uh, let's train it. So there you go. So the loss um, did decrease um, and um, it uh, looks good for now. Let's see what happened. Um, that's a good graph. Um, as long as your validation uh, loss is uh, lower than training loss, you're doing well because you are better at predicting than training, which is kind of better. So um, that looks good, uh, which also means that you can go keep training for longer because um, you have some room to go here. It is still decreasing. And uh, let's uh, see what the losses look like. So looks like we are, um, we're still kind of, not at a very good point. Our accuracy rate is only 70%. So most likely what has happened is it has done the easy part that we already talked about where the pedal width is less than two, then we can uh, very accurately categorize things. So uh, we have some room to go here. Um, so let's see uh, what the prediction looks like. So when we predict, uh, again, we are going to do the same thing where we predict it and we convert that to softmax, uh, which gives you probabilities from log likelihoods. And then we do this argmax, which is find the maximum of those three probabilities. And that is most likely the class that it belongs to. So let's print that. So what it did was, um, uh, these are the predicted classes and um, then we also printed the actuals, which are the actuals. So if you look at it like this, it, it's close enough. Um, it is uh, wrong in many cases. And um, that's um, something we'll have to fix um, because our accuracy is not high enough. So this is cumbersome to look at, like how do we compare? We're, like, we're not gonna do like this one-to-one -one combination and it doesn't help that Python is printing this vertically and this horizontally. So we are gonna to have to find some other way to see how we did in our prediction. So that uh, brings us to a segue into how do we compare when we predict classes. So let's go back to the lecture part. So, so we do doubt that. So in case of, um, of prediction. So that's the problem with prediction. If we did what we did last time, we put a diagonal line and plotted all our predictions. So you would see that uh, they would all, because they are categorical, they would fall at integer values. 
And um, imagine that this dot, there may be hundreds of dots here, which are accurate, uh, but we don't see that in this kind of plot uh, because they're all on top of each other. And there are some other plots here which are uh, kind of wrong prediction, but they're also, there may be many uh, or few, we don't know how well we are performing. So that brings me to um, this diversion uh, that, so imagine now that you have um, a test for a disease uh, that is 99% accurate. So, and the incidence rate of that disease is 1%, which means um, at random in a given population, 1% of the people would have that disease. So, so this is fairly topical uh, because of the COVID-19, um, but bear with me. I think this is um, just to get you thinking about probabilities and how things work. Uh, uh, so if you have uh, 10,000 uh, people that go in for a test, and because the disease incidence rate is 1%, you can expect 100 people to have the disease and 9,900 people to not have the disease. And out of these, because the test is 99% accurate, uh, 99 people are going to be accurately told that they have the disease and 1% is going to be told they have the disease, but they actually don't. And rest of them who don't have the disease, they 99% of them will be told, yes, you are perfectly fine. You don't have the disease. But then 1%, because the test is 99% accurate, 1% will be told that they have the disease. So, so that is, um, that's a big dilemma because at random, if you go for testing, uh, you test positive, there's only a 50% chance that you actually have the disease. So that's pretty remarkable that even with a test that is 99% accurate, um, then um, you still only have a 50% chance of being tested, uh, or if you are tested positive, 50% chance of having the disease. So, so that's why they recommend that you um, only go for testing if you are at risk because what that does is that increases the incidence rate. So if you are at risk, then the incidence rate, even if it jumps to 2%, you can decrease this number by a lot, right? So, so, the way, um, so that's a digression, but I think I want you to understand that how percentages work, how probabilities work and uh, what they mean. So the reason I'm describing this is there are names for these things. So this particular thing is when you are positive and you predict to be positive, that is called true positive. And the rest of them also have names and you may be familiar with that. So let's uh, see what they are. So there's true positive, false negative, true negative, and false positive. So, so these things uh, kind of, you wanna keep that in mind that there are three other sides to a test uh, to a prediction uh, so that we need to pay attention to and uh, try to minimize the false positive and the false negatives as much as possible so that these two numbers are as high as possible. So that's um, um, what I wanted to cover in that. So what we can do with our predictions now is try to categorize them in these four quadrants of um, how well we are doing and how many of these the predictions fall in each of these categories. So that kind of thing is called a confusion matrix. So that looks something like this. So we will plot actual values versus predicted values. And when we have the actual value as positive and we predict it as positive, that will be called a true positive. And similarly for other quadrants as well. So where you want to be, so we will put each sample in the box that it belongs and we'll keep a count of the number of samples that fall into each box. So ideally what you would want is everything to fall along this diagonal where everything should be either true positive or true negative that it means that what you predicted is the actual value and you want to keep 
this diagonal as low as possible in number. So let's do that for our prediction. So all you have to do, this one liner, um, TensorFlow makes a confusion matrix for you automatically from your classes that you predicted. And um, this is the predicted classes and this is the Y, you know, the actual ground truth. So, and then we can plot it using the Seaborn package uh, with this heat map call. This one liner will give us a nice looking plot. So again, um, actual values, predicted values. So as you can see, our diagonal is looking pretty good. So again, remember we only have, um, uh, how many do we have in our prediction? Uh, let's see, sorry. Do, 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 do. 24, 24 um, um, data points in our prediction set. So um, as you can see, um, this thing as we knew is very easy to predict um, and then other things. So diagonal looks pretty good. Uh, these two elements, they are, um, they're the wrong answers basically. So things that were actually category one have been predicted to be category two. And then in this case, uh, vice versa. So it looks like it got confused between um, uh, two of those categories. So what can we do? For what we want is most numbers to be on this diagonal. So let's um, fix that. Okay. So one way to do that is, um, as we saw in our training, things uh, were going pretty good. We could just train for a little bit longer. And um, you can rebuild the model and train more, or we can just um, just train here now. Uh, so it will take over from where it left off. And let's just train more. So we trained more. It uh, went pretty fast. Um, and I don't know why or how, but um, so the thing has already increased a lot, the accuracy, the loss has decreased. So let's see what it looks like now. That's still pretty good. Uh, graph looks nice. Uh, let's print the accuracy and the loss. Uh, that doesn't look good. What happened here? Okay, something is off. So let's predict again. Let's draw our heat map again. So that didn't turn out good. So something is off. Let me just restart the whole thing. Okay, that was good. So what I'm going to do is instead of 10 epochs, I'm just going to run it for 20. So that looks good. Let's see the losses. It looks like accuracy has increased. And now we're going to try to predict again. And this is hard to look at. So we're going to do a plot. So looks like few values jumped from here to here and then our diagonal looks much better. So which means we are only predicting four of these values wrong and rest of them are good. So you may think we can train more and get better results. Let's try more. So Let 
TensorFlow is giving me problems today. Okay, so it looks like it's increased a bit more. And um, let's plot this. It still looks good. The plots are okay. And accuracy. So over time, things will get better as we go along until you get um, almost 99% accuracy in this case. So you'll reach a point where you will overtrain and it will memorize the data because our data points are not that many. So you want to be mindful of that, that you don't uh, overtrain. So it looks like it's stabilized a bit and then it stays there. So that's the idea behind classification. And um, that's all good. So let's go back to the presentation now. All right. So. So we did the classification. Um, we talked about this maximum likelihood thing and um, I didn't describe it in detail at that point, but um, let's um, take a look at what that means because this is an important concept and in the last eight minutes or so we have, I'll cover it uh, today and then I'll cover it again um, on Monday so that uh, it uh, resonates with you and uh, you keep that in mind. So. A little bit of the statistics and probability. So you've seen this curve before, probably. It's a, it's a bell curve or a normal curve um, of a distribution. Uh, what that means is um, that if you have random things that you sample from, and if your samples are independent, and if they are identically distributed, so again, those are technical words, um, then uh, they tend to form a a distribution that is shaped like this. So uh, again, this distribution has some mean and some standard deviation, which means all the values that have a mean or an average, um, and then variance is just a um, square of the difference from the mean. So, so the normal curve looks something like this, and what uh, different uh, values in Y mean is that they are probability densities, so which is given by this complicated looking equation. Um, again, don't be intimidated by this. This is just remember, this is some equation that given a distribution, which is uh, defined by just two numbers, which is the mean and the standard deviation, um, then um, the probability of any given point is given by this equation. So for example, when X is equal to the mean, which is the mu, you can substitute mu here, and you'll get some probability. And um, the way this um, curve is, um, or this distribution works is, when X is mu, the probability is the highest, which is this peak. So mu is also the mean. So the mean is has the highest probability. And, as you go farther from the mean, the probability, which is the vertical lines, they keep decreasing as you go until they become like almost zero. So what this means is that on average things belong here and um, as they deviate from the average, they become rarer and rarer because the probability keeps decreasing as you go along. So this is pretty abstract for you. Um, so hopefully I can explain with an example. So imagine uh, you have a factory that is uh, making nails, for example, and you have this requirement for making nails that are say two inches long. And um, you, are, um, you start this uh, machinery that uh, takes this um, um, kind of, uh, tubes of metal and cuts them into nails. And you have some cutting mechanism, you have some measuring mechanism, and all of these introduce a small little error. So what you get out is on average a nail that is two inches long, but um, mostly they are not exactly two inches long because the cutting process may be a little bit variation in that measuring your measuring of the dimension may be a little bit off 
the temperature in the factory may affect how pliant the metal is and all those factors kind of introduce just a little bit of error in the cutting and the measuring and the overall result is that you don't get a nail that is two inches long you get something around that so but most of the nails will be around two inches so it will be somewhere here and once in a while you'll have some fluke that you cut very wrong and you get a, a nail that is only an inch long so that will fall somewhere here it's a rare occasion but it might happen and uh, the opposite might happen where you get a super long nail because that part of the tube that you cut is super pliant for some reason or something bad in manufacturing and you may fall here where you get a three inch nail so um, that is um, the process of how we get to these um, independent random variables um, that are distributed in nature in processes uh, randomly but they follow some kind of a normal distribution where most of them fall around an average or a mean but uh, um, as you go along and rarer the event the farther they are from the mean and uh, higher the standard deviation and you might some of you might also know this from industrial processes where this thing is called one standard deviation of a two standard deviation of a three standard deviation of a and so on. So there's where the term like six sigma comes from, where things are six standard deviation away. So if your process has um, a six sigma uh, qualification, which means that the errors are so rare that they've kind of fall off the chart. So it's a pretty robust process if you can claim to be a six sigma process. Um, it also depends on the height of the curve. If your curve is too flat, which means your standard deviation is pretty high to begin with, then six sigma may not mean as much. So you may also want to take into account what it means. So um, I will stop here because this is already a lot to take in. And then next time we will go even a step further and uh, try to build on this knowledge of what a normal distribution is and how to use that. Um, Again, uh, I want you to go back um, today and take away from this lecture is to think in terms of distribution. Think of every processy, um, processes in general about how things that come out of it are normally distributed, um, height of people, um, height of trees, what is the distribution look like? And uh, then you'll see that they all kind of fall in this kind of shape and uh, there is, um, normal uh, it's a technical term it's a normal distribution um, so uh, spend some time thinking about these things and then we will build on that so this comes from like um, Richard Feynman who's like one of my favorite uh, kind of teachers and uh, scientists he would say that anytime you ask a question if you don't have the machinery to understand it it gets harder to kind of explain for somebody. So, but now that um, we are building this machinery that will help you understand, uh, and then by next lecture, you would uh, know actually more than 90% of the people in this field, what these distributions are, how things work. So it will greatly expand your knowledge. So keep at it. Uh, it may sound a little bit obtuse, but uh, it's all based on statistics, but then also you can project it onto natural phenomena outside and see what kinds of things fall into this distribution. So there are other kinds of distributions like binomial, um, uh, Poisson, um, but we're not gonna cover those. I think you get the general idea of what a distribution is. So we'll talk in terms of distributions from next time on. So for your homework, um, I want you to, again, just think about these things in general, and you can look at the flower classification, um, see uh, how it worked. And if you have any questions, again, uh, talk to me um, on Twitter if you have a Twitter account. If not, find me on LinkedIn. You can just get in touch with me any which way possible. Uh, and uh, I'll help you guide if you are running into problems. And um, that's uh, all I have to say for today. So hopefully next time you'll come ready to learn uh, more and we'll go into a little bit of math, but uh, not a whole lot to get you uh, accustomed to talking in terms of distributions. All right, thank you very much for your time.